All right. <clears throat> thanks, Brian, and thanks, Amanda. <clears throat> thanks for that uh, quick background on all of the Leomo Run MPIs. Um, we'll definitely be revisiting some of those MPIs during the presentation. So if you have some questions about how they work or what they're measuring or how to apply them, um, we'll see if I can cover that for you. And if not, please ask any questions you have using the Q&A tab. Um, we will, at the end, hand it back over to Brian to just get a quick review on uh, some final points. And then we'll spend the rest of the time on Q&A, answering any questions you have, opening it for discussion. So um, as I go, please, uh, any questions that come up, just uh, click on that Q&A tab and fire away. Um, yep, so today, as mentioned, I am going to take you through my method of identifying form breakdown with Leomo Run and using that information to enhance our training. Um, ultimately, any data that we get as a coach, we want it to be actionable. It's not just, um, you know, having the data looks good or makes us feel like we're being data driven or, you know, um, doing some complex processes. Uh, you know, it's really about taking what we have, taking those tools and the data we get from them and ultimately using that information to enhance training or to enhance performance or to elicit a better response with yourself or another athlete. So um, that's really the main goal we want to focus on here is applying this information that we have. So we know that maintaining your best running technique is important to your performance. Um, the question that I want to answer today is how can we use the Leomo Run MPIs to train and manage this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give some background on what fatigue is, uh, why it is a little bit hard to measure or why it has been historically hard to measure, and how we can simplify this into an actionable method and I'll show some different uh, use cases from some elite runners around the Boulder area. So let's start here, tracking fatigue. Um, you know, to start off, let's just, let's just talk a little bit about fatigue because there are a lot of different ideas of fatigue. It's a term that is often used to summarize many different processes in the body that contribute to a loss of performance. Um, so there's not really one super simple way to think of fatigue. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of contributing factors, everything from mental, uh, physical, you know, um, muscular versus neurological, all these different areas. So um, it can be a little complex. We're going to break this down a little bit into a more digestible format. Uh, but the key point is, I think most athletes and most athletes that I've worked with are familiar with the idea of fatigue. They know that at some point in training and racing, they become tired. Uh, they might be unable to keep their pace. They may be sore in some new areas. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's a familiar concept. It's a, it's a concept that is definitely a constant in training and just being able to manage and work around that and balance the fatigue in training is so important. And in my experience as a coach, I found, especially for elite athletes, the most important job of a coach a lot of times is just to effectively manage and balance fatigue in training. Uh, there's an old saying that says, you know, uh, Olympians are going to be Olympians for the most part. And, uh, and the rule number one of coaching is, is do no harm. And rule number two of coaching is um, to effectively manage and balance training. And so uh, we can see this is a really uh, relevant topic. And I'm, I'm pretty excited because some of the ways of going about this in the past have been pretty challenging, pretty roundabout, um, unreliable. And uh, with the new Leomo Run MPIs, we've got a new tool at our disposal to be able to um, enhance this process a little bit. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, to truly understand fatigue is very complex, as we can see here. Um, this is an image that's adapted from probably my favorite local uh, fatigue researcher, uh, Roger Anoka and Ishito. And this outlines many of the contributing mechanisms of fatigue. So we can see there's you know, perceived fatigability, there's performance fatigability, there's muscle, um, there's psychological factors, all of these different things. And uh, these are, you know, the point here is that there's a lot of elements that contribute. And to try to manage and measure all of these things individually is something that is just, uh, is still being researched. It's not, you know, there's, there's just a lot of factors, the big model. So the goal for us is going to be you know, how can we break this down into a simple, actionable process? And, um, you know, to put all of these into practice, I don't think we, 
I don't think we really need to investigate all these fine details too much. We can start by just focusing on the observable changes that we can see and the outcomes of training, and especially useful when we can do that with data. And so how do we currently measure and track fatigue? Um, well, pretty commonly, you know, in, our, in practice, you know, the way that coaches or athletes will do this is a lot simpler than that last slide. Um, you know, I, I like to think of it as sort of two areas of, of stress that we're trying to think about when we're training. One, the big one would be metabolic stress, you know, and that's pretty commonly tracked and, and managed via miles or heart rate or pace or the various stress scores that are out there. You know, these, we probably all, if you're an athlete or a coach, you've probably used one of these methods at least once in your, in your training career. And, um, you know, these can be useful. They're available, they're simple, um, but, uh, you know, they all have their own drawbacks, of course, with everything. Um, but really the, the key for me is that next point, biomechanical stress. You know, it's, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these ways that, that we're tracking our training and managing our training is just based on these like uh, this ideas of, of getting metabolic benefit, of gaining fitness and gaining aerobic strength. Um, and, uh, and a lot of times that's, you know, half the puzzle because we've got another kind of stress. Running is an impact sport. We have, we're hitting the ground on every step for hundreds of thousands of steps per week. And uh, there's an element there of structural stress, as I like to call it, biomechanical stress. How well are we moving? How well are we interacting with those forces of impact? How well are we transferring that into um, more efficient motion? And uh, so this is a really key area because um, as we'll see in some other slides, this has big implications for training, injury, recovery, and things like that. Um, but you know, I think the key point here, if we look at these graphs over on the right side, in that top one, you know, we've probably all seen our heart rate. We look at, you know, running at a constant pace. It's, you know, it's sometimes our, our stress to, a, to achieve that pace is not uh, constant. We, you know, we can see heart rate drift. Uh, we can see because of various factors like, you know, say heat or, you know, fatigue, breakdown of form, we might see that heart rate increase just to be able to maintain the same pace. And um, that right there is essentially efficiency. If we look at the one below that, same thing can happen with our, with our technique. We can think of the same thing as a sort of um, technique drift. You know, heart rate drift happens on long efforts, and uh, that's essentially where you know, we'll just see the heart rate slowly rise over time, even though you're working at the same output. And the same thing can happen with our technique quality. If we want to think of that as an arbitrary metric of technique, you know, a lot of times in races, even like you know, Olympic marathon, where we expect some of the, the, the fittest marathoners in the world um, a lot of times we'll see by the end of the race that technique has really drifted and started to decline in order for them to maintain that same pace. And what ultimately happens is the cost of maintaining that pace goes up. Um, so the final point here is the self-report. And I think right now this has been probably, you know, my best way of, of trying to quantify this biomechanical stress is just asking myself or asking an athlete, how are you feeling today? Do you have any aches and pains? Do you have any new niggles that we need to address? You know, um, and really it's, 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 a, it's a great method. Um, it certainly has a lot of research that says that self-report can be extremely powerful. Um, but you know, there's still a subjective aspect to it and, uh, and it makes it a little bit difficult to know why somebody is feeling that way. Right? I'm getting this sort of pain in my hip or I'm, you know, my knee is feeling a little bit weak on this side. Uh, it's hard to see what is happening in their running form that is actually potentially contributing to that. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit more about today, too. So enter Leomo Run MPIs. We now have an option to program better workouts, adjust training, manage this sort of biomechanical stress using our motion data that we have at our disposal. So we can see here just three quick examples of various workouts um, and the MPI responses to those workouts. We can see smoothness, you know, sort of steady, that's on a steady tempo, and we can see this gradual increase towards the end, the loss of smoothness, uh, the strike angular range, a gradual decline as the, work, uh, as the workout progresses, you know, sort of a loss of that preloading and force production, and the heel pitch during an interval workout, we see that slowly getting higher as the intervals go on. Um, to remind heel pitch, the lower the percentage is better. That's essentially um, the time spent on ground converting the vertical force of that propulsion 
as a percentage of the total stride time. So in the best case scenario, we see a lower percentage there. And so specifically, why does biomechanical stress or fatigue matter? I think of this in uh, you know, three key factors here. Number one is injury, obviously. Changes in movement can change muscle utilization. We're out on a, a, a hard, long tempo run, and towards the end of that, we're starting to fatigue a little bit. Our muscles are not firing as well. You know, any of those factors that we saw on that previous slide could be contributing. Um, but ultimately, what results is our motion begins to change. In order for us to keep going, we start to rely on different muscle groups or change the way that we're utilizing certain muscles a little bit, and that can cause unintentional overload of muscles. And, uh, and that is a key factor for uh, potentially getting injured. So uh, maintaining the form has a whole, lot of, a whole lot of value just on that first point there in preventing injury. Uh, the second one is breakdown of form. Uh, when we experience breakdown of form, uh, we ultimately just have a lower quality of training. Um, junk miles are only junk miles if they are treated as such. That's what I usually say as a coach. And if I go out and I'm not really paying attention and I really am just logging miles with, you know, in a mindless manner, um, yeah, those are, in some ways, those are junk miles. Um, because what we're doing is with every mile we run, with every stride we perform, we're reinforcing movement patterns. To quote um, a famous book, neurons that fire together wire together, which means, you know, whatever movement pattern we're habitually moving in, we tend to learn to move in those movement patterns habitually. And so, um, you know, if we're not, you know, as much as possible keeping a focus on maintaining high quality movement patterns, then when the time comes to really express those in a race, we may struggle to hit our best. And our third point is loss of efficiency. Um, to quote a famous coach, being able to be fast for the last six miles of the marathon is what separates the best in the world. And I completely agree with that. I think, you know, conserving energy stores and maintaining your most efficient running uh, form is key to being able to arrive at mile 20 in order, you know, to be able to press the pace for that last 10 kilometers. So um, how, does, how does this vary between individuals? Um, Unfortunately, with, with biomechanics and with human movement, there is no one-size-fits-all method. There's tons of different aspects that contribute to an individual's biomechanics and how they move. And, um, and really, you know, from a research standpoint, there's a, there's a real lack of consensus on um, the best way to sum them all up and bring them all together overall for a population. And so it's really important to think of this on an individual level and try to understand yourself if you're the athlete or if you're coaching an athlete, be able to understand how they move, how they respond and uh, what their background and profile dictates. So um, the first thing is just experience. We find you know, more experienced runners tend to be able to maintain their form better under more extreme loads and stresses and bigger training and harder races at faster paces. Uh, experienced runners tend to be able to hold that form down and be able to keep it constant for longer. Um, strengths and weaknesses. All individuals have different strengths and weaknesses, and these are just the key areas where an individual may tend to break down first. I often see a pretty common pattern that emerges with athletes or myself where, you know, one or two key areas, it, things tend to manifest pretty regularly. So um, identifying those areas is definitely a key as well. And the final one is just individual tendencies. And that means that individuals may react differently in these situations. So when they feel fatigue coming on or when they feel a certain weakness in a certain area, they may try to shift their motion a little bit um, consciously or unconsciously to try to account for that. And that's just based on, you know, their habits and training and just their individual preferences. Um, but we, what we can say is the most important focus right now within your current capability is to be able to develop what I call biomechanical resistance to fatigue. And that just means being able to maintain your form, whatever form it is, being able to maintain it for the full duration of your race or workout is the first step. So up to this point, uh, we're now understanding that fatigue is pretty complex. Measuring biomechanical fatigue can be 
sort of difficult without considering a lot of factors. And it can vary a lot based on just the individual. So, um, you know, we're, we're working towards simplicity here is, is ultimately the goal. And I understand that some things are just not simple, but I think in order, in, in practice, as, as a coach or athlete, we need to try to simplify things as much as possible to make them digestible and to be able to make, um, to make it so that we're not, you know, pulling our hair out and thinking about too many different things at once and taking the focus off of some of the things that really matter. So let's talk a little bit about how to simplify all of this even more and make it work for us. Um, what constitutes good running forms? We just talked about how this is very different across a lot of people and um, an individual's you know, efficiency and self-selected form can vary a lot. There's so many interrelated factors. So to really sum it up and uh, you know, try to set some rules that I apply to uh, across individuals as, as goals to work towards would be these four pillars. Number one is just a stable, smooth control of the hips and the trunk or the center of mass. Number two is a full range of motion around the hips. Number three is force production capacity and tolerance. And number four is maximal utilization of elastic energy. And um, working with just those four points, we can really sum it up that a reduction or loss in any of those traits is going to have a negative impact on running motion and performance. So not a bad place to, not a bad place to start in our application. Let's think about these four points as we get into these MPIs and these case studies. Okay, so what is the process we're gonna go through? Um, well, we have some basic criteria in those four points. And in order to apply it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest a, a very simple method here. Um, the first thing to do is to just use the MPIs to see where your fatigue tends to manifest. Like we said, in certain individuals, it's going to look different. And so we need to understand uh, on an individual level where things tend to go first. Um, and then those would be our priority metrics. And that, that helps us just make this automatically athlete specific. Um, so what would be bad? Things we want to watch for are going to be decreases in the key metrics we want to maintain, any asymmetries that increase in magnitude, and any lower MPI values than previous workouts. Um, so the cases that I'm going to show today are mainly going to focus on number one and number two there on what is bad. Um, and that's just because this is a, these are all single workout uh, case studies. So um, you know, in the future, we'll you know, maybe show some different workouts over time and things like that to compare. But today, it's just uh, a couple different athletes going through this process. So what I'm going to do first in, in this sort of uh, method for each of these athletes is first thing I do is general overview. I just try to take a, a broad look at all of the data and just sort of pick out any key things that stick out to me, you know, any notable values or points of weakness as the baseline. And this is just going to help us understand overall an athlete's profile and their individual needs. Um, then we're going to look at any asymmetries, where, where do they change? Are there ones that increase in magnitude? And then we're going to try to identify any decline in quality of movement or any decline in form. And, uh, and then we'll talk about how to improve your training or what the recommendations would be to change training based on how we're seeing this breakdown. So getting into this, here's runner number one. Um, we have a quick background, you know, 5K, 10K collegiate runner, recently graduated, um, fairly recently has moved to Boulder uh, at a higher altitude. We're at um, about 5,600 feet here. Uh, I'm not sure what that is in meters, maybe 1,800 meters or so, 1,500 meters. Um, and so she's still acclimating to the new environment. Um, no injury history. And the data from all of these runners is going to be from a 60-minute tempo run. Yeah. Ouch. So starting with our general overview. Um, first, I just want to point out what I've done here is divided this 60-minute tempo run into six lines. At the bottom here is one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, regardless of what workout you're doing this for, you know, we always want to first create segments for comparison if we're going to look at trends of fatigue over time. So if it's an interval workout, that makes it really easy. Let's say it's, uh, um, you know, eight times three minutes or something like that. We're just going to be able to divide up all the intervals and look across the intervals and see how things change. 
Um, <clears throat> if it's a tempo run, I like to split it up in even segments. If it's a long run, the same thing, but maybe a little bit longer segments. So what we have here is uh, six, six 10 minute segments all done at a relatively constant pace. And uh, it's a tempo effort. So um, for our first runner, here's what, here's the you know, two things that I picked that stick out sort of right away. Um, if we're looking at heel pitch across these laps, we can see that um, this right side is a, uh, a little bit high. And um, you know, 34, upper 34 to 35 at this pace is uh, a little bit of a high value. Remember, we want this to be you know, lower is better. And I would say on the left side, 31 to 32 is, um, is a little bit more what I would expect to see. So just one point there, we've got a little bit high heel pitch on the right. Um, the strike angular range, we see some pretty low values on the right. So you know, 1.0, 1.1 gets a little bit better um, towards the end, but still relatively low values. The left side is, um, is better, but certainly could still uh, have some space for improvement. So, um, to me, I'm just looking at this and as a takeaway, I'm seeing, okay, you know, this right leg seems like we might have a little bit of an issue with power production there and with um, elastic energy transfer. So we're just going to keep that in mind, keep that in our pocket as we go forward. So here's just displaying that data again. This is our strike AR. We can see the average from the whole tempo run here and uh, same thing with the heel pitch here. So let's look at these asymmetries next. <clears throat> You know, what we want to see is where do these asymmetries get larger in magnitude um, or really you know any any big notable changes we want to just make a note of so um, the first thing is in this ground contact time we can see starting out uh, not too bad pretty pretty similar here a difference of about six milliseconds so really uh, a really small difference but as things progress as some of the fatigue sets in we see that uh, that magnitude growing quite a bit to uh, 13 milliseconds, which is a uh, over double change. Um, next one is the thigh swing speed down here. We, we can see this starts off pretty even, you know, about seven degrees per second difference. And as the activity progresses, we see that uh, growing in magnitude quite a bit. Um, actually, the thigh swing speed down here increases from seven degrees per second up to 33 degrees per second, which is uh, quite an increase. That's um, about a five times change or so almost. So, you know, this, this, is, this is a key area. We're gonna, we're, what we're going to want to do with this information is try to figure out about how long into the activity these changes are starting to increase in, in, their, in their magnitude. So a lot of times a runner will be able to sustain their, you know, optimal or baseline form for, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then past that point, we start to see some of the struggle set in. We start to see some of these movement patterns change. And that's going to be the real goal here today is identifying at what point do we start to see some of these collections of changes happening? And then how can we shape our training around that? And so with the ground contact time, you know, it maintains pretty evenly for the first 30 minutes before we start to see, um, especially that uh, right side start to increase a whole lot. Left side is even increasing um, in that back half as well. And the thigh swing speed, sort of, um, we could say, you know, after about the 20 minute mark, that asymmetry starts to grow a little bit more. Um, sometimes when we're doing this, it's a little bit of a judgment call. It's not always a super clear threshold. Um, and you got to sort of take all of the information that you have and just make a bit of an educated decision on it. So let's look at just sort of a global decline of form. Next thing we want to do is identify any specific duration where a decline of form from baseline begins. And so looking at, I, I just pulled out these four metrics because they seemed pretty telling. We've got ground contact time, we've got recoil angular range, that's how high the foot is uh, lifting after leaving the ground. We've got heel pitch and we've got strike angular range. And the ground contact time, recoil AR and heel pitch all after about 30 minutes we can see ground contact time starts to trend upwards a lot. That's mean, that means we're spending more time on the ground. Uh, recoil angular range starts to experience a pretty steady decline, which means that we're not releasing energy at toe off uh, quite as well. That foot's not coming quite as high. It's going to affect our swing mechanics. And then the heel pitch, um, you know, a little bit difficult to see here, but that starts to trend a little bit higher after the 30 minute mark, which means that we are ultimately spending more time transferring that vertical force into propulsive force 
and we're getting a little bit less for it, meaning we're not going as far on uh, each strike. Um, strike angular range down here at the bottom, uh, you know, I'm going to give this one maybe 40 minutes in before we start to see this uh, steady decline of the values. So in general, you know, mostly around that 30 minute mark seems to be a pretty important threshold for this runner. And, uh, you know, I think we can, we could probably make some, some conclusions based on how all those things are trending. So, you know, the common duration of the beginning of the decline of form seems to be about 30 minutes. And <clears throat> So, you know, realistically, this runner being with a background in 5K, 10K racing primarily, uh, just may not be ready for tempo work that's at this speed beyond the 30 minute duration. Uh, because what we're seeing is we're seeing those movement patterns are changing, the ability to tolerate those forces and use them to our benefit is changing a little bit. And, um, you know, all those points before about injury risk, loss of efficiency, maintaining form and training good movement patterns are not really being accomplished past those 30 minutes. What we're doing is we are, we are allowing our, our form to decline in order to just complete the workout and accomplish that sort of aerobic work. Um, so, you know, as a coach, you know, the training quality, I see this, I think, you know, we can definitely increase our total quality of training by switching around this workout a little bit, by not exceeding this 30 minute condition. And we can also probably decrease our injury risk by working with those within those parameters as well. Um, so how can we do this? Well, you know, I want to do as much aerobic work as possible. I don't wanna just say, okay, we're only gonna do 30 minute tempo runs now, uh, if we can avoid that. Because um, we still need, you know, for various various reasons, we, we, we still need to be able to accomplish the work that we need to accomplish in order to be fast, but we just want to increase the quality of that. So two ways to, to really be able to start to extend this work duration from 30 minutes and, and ultimately being able to, you know, our, our success metric is going to be to have that, be able to totally get rid of that decline of form, regardless of the duration. Ultimately, we want to get to the 60 minutes without seeing any of that decline. Uh, some ways to train that would be using a broken tempo. Something that I do often with athletes is to just break this into tempo sets that can total more than that 30 minutes, but allow short recoveries. So we might be able to do four times 10 minutes with like a two minute recovery, three times 15 minutes with a three minutes recovery. What we'll, what we'll do then is work up to, you know, once we see good trends with the biomechanical data in those workouts, if, you know, say we, we're hitting 45 minutes of total time now, and we're not seeing any breakdown, we'll try to build up to 60 minutes of broken tempo. So maybe up to six times 10 minutes or four times 15 minutes, three times 20 minutes, et cetera. And uh, once we're seeing that you know, you know, motion maintained, then we might revisit and go for you know, a single effort type of structure again. Uh, the other way that we can sort of work on this is to just during the session, have some specific monitoring of form and feedback. And uh, you know, if you've seen some of our previous webinars, we've talked a lot about our target range feature, which is gonna be a future release, uh, hopefully pretty soon, at least starting with uh, uh, the cycling application. But basically what this does is, it allows you to set a motion target and uh, create a range for where you wanna be with your, with your MPI data. And, uh, and then it'll tell you, it'll provide you live feedback of when you're falling out of that range. And so this is just a great reminder to be able to, you know, choose one or two MPIs you wanna focus on. And then while you're doing the activity, be able to monitor it and just see, okay, am I in the range that I need to be in? Am I starting to fall off in certain areas? Can I tighten things up a little bit and keep a little bit more focus on certain areas of my movement? Um, and that's just another way that we can sort of actively train to start to extend that duration for the breakdown. Um, of course, I'm a big advocate for strength and conditioning training. So um, I always like all the athletes I work with, you know, including myself, to be supplementing their primary training through strength and conditioning methods. Um, so of course, you know, these runners, I'll have them all, and you know, I see this, I see this run data from their workouts, and without even having to do a functional movement assessment or any any sort of um, comprehensive physical assessments in the gym, you know, let's say that they're remote or um, I'm traveling or they're traveling. If I can see this data, even from afar, I can already start to draw some pretty good individual conclusions for them and start to plan better strength training 
programming so that they can make sure they're not wasting their time in the gym and they're focusing on these areas where they really need to improve. Um, so for this runner, it would just be, you know, here's not, not a specific uh, program, but these would be the main aspects of it that we would be focusing on. It would be improving lower body force production, improving that left-right symmetry, especially on the right side, and just improving the utilization of elastic energy. So let's go to runner number two. Um, this is going to follow the same process. It's the same workout. It's a 60 minute tempo run. This particular runner is an elite 3K steeplechase runner and uh, has no injury history. I think, um, I think this runner has a little over eight minute 3K steeplechase PR and a sub 14 minute 5K PR. So um, a pretty speedy, pretty speedy runner. So let's start with our general overview again. <clears throat> what we can see in this case, um, we see ground contact time, strike AR, thigh swing speed sticking out quite a bit. Um, right off the bat, I can see ground contact time. We have a pretty, uh, a pretty notable asymmetry there kind of across the entire workout. So we've got some weakness on that right leg, it looks like, as far as higher ground contact time. We also see in the strike angular range, so the same trend. Um, right side is a much lower range. Um, <clears throat> Right leg is probably having some force production issues combined with a little bit of elastic energy issues. Um, the left side, I would say, strike AR 4.1 at the beginning is pretty good, actually. That's, uh, that's actually, I would consider a pretty moderate value for, um, for a distance runner, so not too bad there. And then in the thigh swing speed, uh, the thing that jumps out about this is just a very large asymmetry right off the bat. You know, we're talking 80 degrees per second of difference that is actually pretty sustained across the workout. So um, uh, that's just something that, that we, we're going to want to consider as well. So yep, yeah, just, uh, just to show the data a little bit closer, we see that strike angular range, low, si uh, low values on the right leg, and simultaneously ground contact time, a little bit higher values there, a little undesirable. So right leg seems to be our, our weak point if we have to pick one. Uh, how do these asymmetries do? Well, let's look at uh, the ground contact time and the thigh swing speed. Basically, the ground contact time, not too bad actually. The asymmetry increases from about 9 to 15 milliseconds, so not a huge change, but it's certainly, uh, it's certainly notable. Um, I think there's until, the, until that is matched and maintained within a pretty tight window for the whole workout, we always have room to improve. Um, and interestingly, the thigh swing speed asymmetry is actually maintained pretty well for the whole workout. So, you know, it's, it's important to remember that it's not, you know, the, the first thing that I focus on is not that they have an asymmetry that's really big, because that could completely be a trained functional asymmetry. There are certain drawbacks to it as far as, you know, are we getting the most out of ourselves that we can, but as far as, you know, injury risk or something like that, just because somebody is asymmetrical doesn't mean that they're going to get injured necessarily. Um, what really matters is how well we're able to maintain our normal movement patterns within what is normal. So I'm um, pretty happy to see that, that that asymmetry is pretty well conditioned and uh, maintained well throughout the whole workout. So let's look at the decline of form then. Where are we, where are we dropping off? Um, two big areas stick out to me here. We see that strike angular range sort of right from, right from the first 10 minutes. So we, again, we have our six laps here, every 10 minute section of the 60 minute tempo. And we can see the left, right values of strike angular range. Um, and really just looking at the data, we can see this slow decline and maybe leveling out a little bit towards the end here. Um, <clears throat> you know, we see starting out 4.1 on the left, 2.8 on the right, and that's all the way down to 2.7 and 1.7 by the end. Um, so, it's, it's a pretty big change. Actually, the left side, that's a decrease of about 52%. Right side decreases by uh, about 65%. Um, so pretty big changes relative to the individual. And then looking at the smoothness, this is, again, this is measured from the pelvis. And this is uh, taking into account the lateral jerkiness of, of the stride. And so if you're very unstable, if you've got tight hips, you're not getting that fluid motion and that stabilization, um, during ground contact, we can see this value start to increase and uh, we can see some high values for people who are, who are very unstable runners. So 
just looking at this, we can see starting at 13, actually really good. Um, I like that value a lot. That's, uh, that's definitely on the low end. That's definitely on the elite end. Um, but we can see it increases throughout the run up to 21, which is, you know, about 60% increase or so. Um, still, you know, 21, not a, not a horrible alarming value. That's still actually pretty good. It's pretty smooth. But what concerns me is, you know, you clearly have the capacity to be operating in this lower range, but we're not able to sustain that and we're losing um, something that is a strength for us by the end. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's especially meaningful to be able to see what somebody is capable of if only they were able to sustain and maintain that motion for a little bit longer. So to summarize this, some recommendations. What we see here is essentially a gradual decline of strike angular range and smoothness, just starting right from the first 10 minutes. It's, this is a pretty much right off the bat, we start to see this decline from the start in both of these areas. And, uh, and to me, you know, it just means that this runner just might not be ready to, uh, to do sustained tempo work at this intensity um, because we're, we're losing the quality of our form and our running techniques so quickly from the start. So one method to, you know, uh, one recommendation I would have is to just reduce the pace a little bit for sustained tempo runs and focus on the form a little bit more. Make that, I mean, clearly this runner is fit. They can go the distance at this effort, but we're not, uh, we're not utilizing our movements very well to be helping us improve. Um, so I may, I may set that as the priority. I may say, you know what, slow it down a little bit and focus on keeping that form tight and then let's work on pushing that pace up a little bit back to where it was. Um, the smoothness values again are great at the beginning. I think we, we ought to maximize that strength by training to maintain it and keep those. So the two ways that we can increase the quality of this intensity, like I just said, reduce the speed and focus on form. I'd probably start with about five seconds per kilometer and build from there. Um, and then the specific monitoring of form, like we just mentioned about target range, um, setting a goal with your MPI, saying I want to stay above this value or I want to stay below this value, and just doing some brief check-ins periodically on the run, seeing how we're doing with that. Are we trending up? Are we trending better? Um, do I need to stop the workout or change it? Um, and for those, it would be definitely smoothness and strike angular range right from the beginning. Training for this individual, pretty similar. Uh, we're gonna just, gen, you know, general, uh, general training to improve force production and improving that left-right symmetry. Uh, probably won't be lifting 415 pounds as, as this runner in the picture is, but, uh, you know, deadlift is not a bad method either. Okay, so our final runner case. This is uh, runner number three is an Olympic level marathoner. And uh, he's had some, you know, a little bit of an injury history on the right leg, uh, some various issues there, and seems to be running pretty healthy right now. And again, 60 minute tempo run. So our general overview, three key areas we're looking at here. Um, basically, you know, ground contact time has a little bit of an imbalance here. Not, not a very large imbalance, but it's something to keep an eye on. Um, strike angular range. Both of these, just a little bit of a positive observation, pretty symmetrical, and these are actually pretty good values, uh, especially for a marathoner. So if you can maintain those and, and work to just be slightly increasing those over time, he's in a great place. And then the smoothness. Overall, we can see kind of high values just in general. I'd, I'd call these moderately high. Uh, we might have some issues around the hips, might be some tightness or some weakness around the hips to, to address. Um, so again, here's our close-up. We can see SAR values pretty symmetric, um, almost trending upwards a little bit, it looks like, just based on the data. And the smoothness value is a little bit high just across the board. So the asymmetries, really the only thing of note here is just the ground contact time. It increases from about 8 milliseconds up to 20 milliseconds at the end. So for me, it's just uh, we're seeing a little bit of a um, uh, decline of form there, and we're seems like it's just a little bit of general fatigue setting in. You know, we're losing the ability to be able to re react off the ground a little bit quicker. So that's really the only notable factor though. This one is doing pretty well overall. Um, we can see though, you know, left versus right side, it seems to be a little bit more specifically the left side that is increasing a lot more. And so given that we know that injury history is a little bit of weakness in that left leg, a little bit of recurring um, uh, injury risk, 
you know, that might be something we want to monitor and really keep tighter tabs on given the, the proneness to, to injury in this individual. So um, decline of form, our final step. Um, like we just said, we can, we can observe these changes in the ground contact time, especially the left side increasing from 235 to 242. And the smoothness as a very gradual increase, 70 to 78. Uh, not a big change, but you know, the thing I'm a little bit more concerned about there is just the actual value of it being a little bit high. So overall, this runner's form is actually pretty well maintained. That's probably why he is an Olympic level marathoner. Um, he displays strengths at this intensity. Tempo is definitely his bread and butter, and he maintains his form well overall. Um, there's definitely some things in there we can focus on to improve, uh, keeping that left leg, you know, monitoring that, keeping the form tight on that, reinforcing those good movement patterns on the left side, especially in that sort of retraining from coming back from that time off, and, uh, and just incorporating some SNC exercises to help with that pelvic movement, you know, making sure that, that smoothness goes down overall, um, opening up the hips a little bit, working on stabilizing the hips, uh, would definitely be the key, the key focus for this runner. So um, that's, our, that's our three cases. That's our, um, that's our methodology for tracking maintenance of form, decline of form, uh, fatigue, biomechanical stress. I'm going to, um, you know, quick summary here. Uh, runner one, you can see kind of their, their take home messages, utilize broken tempo sets, focus on maintaining specific uh, MPIs as duration increases, train some resiliency in the gym, use of elastic energy and force production. Um, runner two, reducing the speed a little bit, focusing more on their form, maximizing the good smoothness values that they're capable of by training to maintain it. And runner three, um, focusing on those smoothness values, maintaining them, working in the gym on pelvic stability, pelvic movement to be able to decrease those values a little bit. Um, I'm going to go into some of the questions that we have before we uh, finish up here. So, <clears throat> got some got some really great great questions. Um, one question, first question is from uh, from Rich. Um, what was your input on uh, SMO2 to indicate stress and fatigue, that's saturation, muscle oxygen? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I think SMO2 can be can be really interesting. And um, you know, if you're using the Human Hex or, uh, or these Moxie uh, uh, SMO2 sensors, I've uh, done a little bit with that in the past. And I think for me, the, the key take home is, you know, they're providing more measurements for us. And as we know, like I, you know, early on when I showed that slide, this is a very complex puzzle. And for me personally, it sort of depends on your, you know, the level of analysis you want to do and, and what you're comfortable with. But I like to have, you know, the more information, the better. And the nice combination I see with SMO2 with LIOMO sensors is um, it's, it's, uh, it's a relationship that makes sense because we can see how you're moving. We can get biomechanical metrics and biomechanical data of you know, kinematically what's happening in your motion. And with the SMO2 sensors, we can see what the impact is at the muscular, uh, at the muscular metabolic level of how some of these changes in motion are affecting the utilization of specific muscles. And so, um, you know, I think, I think the two of them can be used to enhance one another quite a bit, um, especially for these same topics of uh, stress and fatigue. Um, let's see, from Chris. Uh, let's see, do we have ranges that are the goal for all of these metrics uh, that we measure? So uh, yeah, do we have like an absolute scale that we shoot for? Um, yeah, you know, so in general, all of these metrics have, oh, I would say, let's see, I'd say most of them have a, a pretty absolute target. Um, strike angular range, um, higher is gonna be better in most cases. Um, for recoil angular range, that one is gonna be a little bit more of based on the individual and um, their you know, body size and limb lengths and things like that. Um, but in general, a little bit higher for a given speed on recoil is going to be better. For heel pitch, lower is always better. For smoothness, lower is always better. Um, and for thigh swing speed, that's a little bit similar to recoil, where it's going to depend on the individual a little bit. Um, so, um, you know, we do, we have these ideas of kind of what the absolute goal would be, but really the key is 
um, before we ever get there, you know, I, I would never just tell somebody, hey, you know, your strike angular range is two degrees and I want it to be 10 degrees. Uh, that's gonna be really hard to change, right, you know, overnight. And it also might be a little bit too big of a change um, as far as what their habitual uh, motion is and what they're you know, trained to and what their tolerance is for movement. So um, we have to be careful when we're making adjustments to running form, obviously at the right time of the year, at the right point in training. And uh, the first step is to see what the baseline is and then work with an individual to be able to sustain their normal motion, which is what this was all about. But then over time, slowly improve that motion and see some of those values change towards the side that you want. Um, let's see. Uh, if the measurement does show inefficiencies or red flags, are, is there guidance in the corrective actions that you can take part in as a part of your post-purchase support? Um, yeah, you know, I think the Leomo team pretty regularly interacts with, uh, with our community um, on a daily basis. And we have several Facebook groups that are available that are um, moderated you know, daily uh, where you can post questions, you can post your data, you can post general discussions and just talk about, hey, I'm seeing you know, this certain behavior in my movement. You know, do, do, do other people have thoughts in this? And, and members of the Leomo team will actively participate in those discussions as well to uh, just help increase that understanding and give a little guidance on what you can do to start to improve. And let's see, last question is, how do you tell when asymmetry is an injury risk? Oh, this is a terrific question from Rich, thank you. Um, so sort of like I talked about a little bit, asymmetry in itself is, um, is not a concern to me as a, from, from an injury standpoint most of the time. Um, if that's something that they, they habitually display, it's just part of their natural movements, you know, if you watch the if you watch the end of a a, a, um, a Grand Slam marathon, say the Berlin Marathon or London or New York, uh, you're going to see a lot of really uh, wonky, funky, asymmetrical movement in these runners, even these world class runners uh, towards the end. And so a lot of them just possess these asymmetries. It's just their natural movement, and it's it's uh, it's the way that they have adapted their training and their movement to be able to succeed. So, you know, the asymmetry itself, not, not a big concern for me. It's when I start to see changes in movement patterns that, uh, that I start to, you know, raise a little bit of a red flag as an area that we can improve. So if we see an asymmetry and, uh, and we see the relationship of, you know, the left and the right side changing, then that can mean that we're shifting the sorts of, um, you know, to keep it simple, just the sorts of stress that we're placing on those various body parts. Um, so the basically you could think of it as, you know, kind of the dynamic has changed a bit and uh, and when we go and undergo those changing movement patterns, we sometimes can unintentionally overload certain areas of the body and increase our risk a little bit. So um, is there a specific threshold for when that, you know, injury risk sets in? That's going to be largely dependent on the individual. Um, you know, I sort of just... Uh, through talking with them and their history and their past, for somebody who's very injury prone, I might you know, be a little bit stricter in my recommendations and really try to uh, keep maintaining their baseline form as close as possible, a focus of training and retraining um, to build strength within that. Um, if it's somebody who's never been injured before and they, you know, we see this habitual pattern of breakdown and the breakdown occurs you know, kind of similarly, yeah, it's definitely not desirable, but uh, you know, they may have a little bit higher threshold for injury. You know, maybe they can tolerate a little bit more of that breakdown before something overloads too much. So to answer it is it's it's pretty individual, but I, I don't think it's a bad idea to um, just set the goal of maintaining as close as possible to your normal baseline as you can in training for that. So great questions, everybody. I, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you um, watching the presentation today. Uh, <clears throat> please interact with us. Again, I'm, I'm Joe Cavaretta, sports scientist at Leomo. I can, you can reach me through our support channels if you want to talk about specific topics for training, analyzing data, um, talking about fatigue, maintaining motion, any of these things. Feel free to uh, shoot us a message on social media or at support at leomo.io and uh, just drop my name and they'll get you connected with me. So thanks very much.